member. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and keep members on their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of business, uh, close of the hearing, rather, whichever comes first. And hearing no objection, that is so ordered. Without objection, the chair may declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. Without objection, the member from Minnesota, Representative Stauber, and the member from Nebraska, Representative Fortenberry, are authorized to join us today and question the witnesses in today's hearing. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at the following email address, hnrcdocs at house, oh, sorry, at mail.house.gov. Members who are physically present should provide a hard copy for staff to distribute by email. Now, additionally, please note, as always, members are responsible for their own microphones. So like our in-person meetings, members uh, will only be muted if staff finds that necessary to avoid inadvertent background noise. Uh, with the uh, spreading Delta variant, uh, new guidance from the attending physician, and the known presence of some unvaccinated colleagues and others in the Capitol, most of us are joining today's hearing uh, remotely. Unfortunately, I say that as someone who has wanted to get back into the hearing room, has been in the hearing room, but most of us are remote today. Pursuant to committee rule 3L and the latest guidance from the attending physician, anyone who is present in the hearing room today must wear a mask covering their mouth and nose. It's my hope that with everyone's cooperation, we can protect the safety of all members and staff and the families they return to at home. The committee has masks available for any member who needs one. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. I'll now recognize myself uh, for five minutes. The subcommittee's meeting today to consider 15 bills. 12 of them are bipartisan or Republican-led. One of the bipartisan bills in the docket today that I'm especially proud to uh, be sponsoring, uh, I'm sponsoring with my friend, Mr. Graves. It's the Illegal Fishing and Forced Labor Prevention Act. Illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, or IUU fishing, is a serious global problem. As we've discussed previously in this subcommittee, IUU fishing is closely linked to financial crimes, fraud and mislabeling, human trafficking and forced labor. A U.S. International Trade Commission report found that nearly 11% of total U.S. seafood imports in 2019, that's $2.4 billion worth of seafood, were products of IUU fishing. Not only is this contributing to overfishing and slavery at sea, it's undercutting honest American fishers who play by the rules and operate some of the most sustainable fisheries in the world. The Illegal Fishing and Forced Labor Prevention Act addresses IUU fishing comprehensively. It improves the seafood import monitoring program by expanding its requirements to all species, increasing data requirements, improving detection of imports at risk of IUU fishing and labor violations. The legislation also, also establishes seafood traceability and labeling requirements to crack down on seafood fraud, which is something consumers have been demanding for years. And among other provisions, the bill strengthens the international fisheries management and expands the definition of IUU fishing to include human trafficking, forced labor, and other labor rights violations. Now, the Dean of the House, Mr. Young, also has several bills before us today. The American Fishery Advisory Committee Act would establish an advisory committee made of representatives of the seafood harvesting and processing industries to manage awards for fisheries research and development grants. We'll also examine the Prevention of Escapement of Genetically Altered Salmon in the United States Act which would place prohibitions on selling, purchasing, and possessing genetically modified salmon and other fish species. And the last bill from the Dean is the Keep Fin Fish Free Act, which would prohibit commercial fin fish aquaculture operations in the US EEZ until there is an authorizing statute for those activities. So turning our attention to other bills, the uh, uniting factor is that Congress can do more to aid the critical state of our planet's biodiversity. One million species are threatened with extinction. That should, should be a wake up call to all of us. And while there's no one size fits all solution to the extinction crisis, some of the bills we're considering, such as Representative Dingell's ambitious Rawa Act, 
would make a difference. It would provide an additional $1.3 billion in annual dedicated funding to assist states, territories, and tribes in their efforts to conserve wildlife. Representative Cartwright's SAFE Act also takes aim at the climate and biodiversity crisis by codifying previous congressional directives to strategically improve the resilience of fish, wildlife, and plants in the face of climate change. Overlooked species groups like monarchs and other butterflies, amphibians, Pacific plants, freshwater mussels, and southwest desert fish, they're particularly vulnerable and they need careful attention to ensure their survival. These groups would be helped by the resources provided by bills from Representative Panetta, Jeffries, and Grijalva. My bill, the Critically Endangered Animals Conservation Act, would provide resources as well to highly at-risk species around the world. Other species groups face challenges that demand careful solutions from Congress. The Bear Protection Act would uh, protect bears by prohibiting the trade of their body parts. This is uh, something that's in high demand on the black market for fake medicinal purposes. The Marine Mammal Research and Response Act would reauthorize the Prescott Program, which ensures that marine mammals in need can be rescued and rehabilitated. Another bill, the Captive Primate Safety Act, eliminates the dangerous and inhumane pet trade of primates. These animals are simply not suited for captivity, and owners of these animals are at risk from aggressive behavior and diseases that primates can easily pass to humans. Finally, just as certain species groups require extra attention, certain ecosystems do as well. So Representative Maloney's bill, the Highlands Conservation Reauthorization Act, would expand protections for the deciduous and coniferous forests, streams, and lakes of the highlands in the Northeast. On the opposite coast, the kelp forests of the North Coast of California in my district have decreased by 95% with serious impacts on our coastal communities and ecosystems. We must act to save them and my bill, the KELP Act, would provide restoration grants for kelp recovery. There's a lot on the agenda today, and I look forward to discussing all of these bills at length. I now recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for holding this hearing. Today's hearing includes 15 bills that amend federal fisheries and wildlife law. The bills range in topics from aquaculture in federal offshore waters to conservation funding for state and wildlife agencies to establishing endangered species programs. I'd like to focus many of my remarks on the Endangered Species Act, since it's a law that is having an unbelievably huge and negative impact on my congressional district, and since it plays a large part in the bills we're going to discuss today. As many of you know, the Federal Climate Irrigation Project, located in drought-stricken Oregon, has for the first time ever received a zero uh, percent allocation of stored water, and the drought has a lot to do with that but there are other factors, one of which is the water required by two endangered fish species in the Upper Klamath Lake, which lake, as a result of the government's decision to give no water to the nearby community, is almost completely full right now, while the adjacent farms and neighborhoods and almost 200,000 acres of prime farmland and other areas downstream are left with very little or no water. The people in the communities around the Klamath Lake believe, as their fields turn to dust and their homes wells dry up, that the Biden administration looked at the ESA and then made a choice between water for fish on the one hand or water for people, and determined that the law, as they chose to interpret it, requires that all of the water go to the fish, leaving communities and farms and homes and people to the ravages of the drought. Meanwhile, the two agencies charged with protecting the fish Yes, two separate agencies fight over who gets the water taken from the farmers and the communities. Should it go to the lake fish or should it go to the downstream salmon? U.S. Fish and Wildlife in the Salmon's Corner, National Marine Fisheries in the lake, lake fish corner, no agencies in the communities where homes and dry wells now are found are in the farmer's corner. It's clear that a single species management isn't working for species or people. And this is what prompted the bipartisan introduction of H.R. 866, a bill introduced by Mr. Calvert, Mr. Costa, and others, which sought to bring sanity to the means of how our endangered species are currently managed by two often conflicting agencies. The concept was to merge the two into one. In fact, former President Obama acknowledged the need for this in his 2011 State of the Union address. We asked to include this bipartisan bill in today's hearing along with two others, H.R. 286, sponsored by Mr. Tiffany of Wisconsin to delist the gray wolf, a species widely acknowledged to be recovered, and H.R. 1174 offered by Mr. Rosendale and others to avoid another ESA bite of the apple when it comes to federal land management plans 
already approved, we were denied hearings on these bills or a hearing on these bills. Instead, we are left with the impression that the majority wishes to focus only on using money as the solution to the problems faced by endangered species. To be sure, funding is an important part of what is needed, but we need to look at improving the regulatory side of the equation as well. And we need to look at some of the decisions made by the Biden administration on the ESA, starting with the decision to expand the northern spotted owl critical habitat, an action which will only increase the ferocity of the forest fires now burning in Oregon and further decimate the owl's habitat policy that results in the reality of hundreds of thousands of acres of truly and horribly scorched earth. The Biden administration is also considering potential listings for a number of other species, including the monarch butterfly, the subject of at least two of today's bills. Our witness today, Mr. Justin Johns of Minnesota, will talk about proactive and effective voluntary work that helps endangered species and proactive work that a listing of the butterfly will only stifle. There is no doubt that as currently implemented, the Endangered Species Act often results in draconian effects, damaging to people and the very species such actions are supposed to help. Conservation and the utilization of CCAs and CCAAs are far preferable uh, to the regulation by lit to regulation through litigation. We need to examine and identify ways to incentivize more people to innovate and not punish them with regulatory listings that will only stifle conservation and bring ruin, such as now the case in the Klamath, to once vibrant communities. As I said, funding is a very small part of the equation. We should be looking at much more than that today. With that, uh, Mr. Chair, I welcome the members here today and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I thank the ranking member and I, I do want to assure the ranking member that any bill, Republican or otherwise, that would actually take us forward on species protection and habitat protection uh, will be considered for a hearing in this subcommittee. Um, so I look forward to working with the ranking member on that. Um, I also understand the committee's, uh, the full committee's ranking member, Mr. Westerman is here. So Mr. Westerman, um, we'll recognize you for five minutes. I'm just, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, but I don't think Mr. Westerman is here this morning. Okay, that's my second week in a row, I'm misreading Mr. Westerman, sorry about that. Um, so we're gonna move on to our first panel. And uh, before we do that, let me just remind those attending in the hearing room, uh, you wanna please refer to the timer on the WebEx platform, which is gonna be visible in the, uh, the grid screen in the hearing room so you can keep track of time as we go forward. Our first panel today uh, is a congressional panel featuring uh, the bill sponsors for today's agenda. Each member will be recognized for five minutes to speak to their legislation. I'll now recognize uh, the Dean of the House, Representative Young from Alaska for a statement on his three bills. John, are you there? Wait a minute, no, go ahead. Oh, you can hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we got you. I apologize, my technician uh, did not put the sound on. So I just wanna ask you to uh, whoever is running the shop, uh, when the, my time is up, let me know because I don't see it on my screen. I'm in time, inclined to talk a little down. So. No, that's un unheard of. We'll let you know. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for these hearings. Uh, I've reviewed most of these bills. I would say most of them are, will have my support. I am concerned, as the ranking member said, about some of the things that are occurring and the balance between uh, water and fish and, and farmers and people. But uh, I want to thank you for listening to my three bills. Uh, they're very simple bills have bipartisan support, your sponsors are one of them. Um, the one, of course, is the prevention and escapement of genetically altered salmon. Uh, one of our greatest assets is in Alaska and across this country is wild salmon. And I've talked to the Commerce Committee, uh, excuse me, Department, NOAA, they want to put uh, fisheries in, uh, what I call hatchery fisheries in our area. Uh, we don't want that. Uh, we want our wild fish to be wild. And I think it gives a higher value to it and we'll take care of the fish, and I'm sure we're confident this bill helps do that. And of course, we have the uh, fin, uh, Keep the Fin Fish Free Act, the act is supported bipartisanly, should work very well. And then we have, of course, the last one, I believe, the last one is the, um, I've got to look at my notes here, uh, the uh, commission, uh, the group around that debates the, the concept of recognizing the value of fisheries and the uh, everybody involved from the catchers to the processors to the consumer and all down the line genetically identified. One of the biggest dangers we have in all industry is not only the 
effect upon the species is the interference, as you mentioned before, of um, outside fisheries illegally uh, flooding our markets, about $2 billion worth. So uh, these are three simple bills. I hope the, the uh, people of the committee will, uh, along with yourself, will support and move these legislative packages uh, forth to the full house and get things done. Uh, they're positive. They're right for the fish industry. They're right for the species. And they're right for this committee. And I believe it will be the right step, step forward. I again, thank you for having this meeting. Uh, I think it's important. I'm sorry to Zoom myself. I do not like Zoom. Uh, I don't be able to smack you if I want to, but I'd shake your hand if I want to, too. So uh, that's very important to me. But anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Keep it up and all the other witnesses. I may not be here for questions. They even got a question. You better ask me now while I got some time left. Are you are you sure you want to leave two minutes and 43 seconds on the clock? I've never <laughs> seen so, this. Someone wants to, if someone wants to use it, they're welcome to use it. You know, I, you, know I, I, you know how I feel about Sam and you and participated in some of my species the other night. Uh, and thank you for coming too. But uh, we, we are very, very, uh, very sensitive about our salmon industry. So we have some problems. Uh, we recognize it. You know, as one of the, some of the species are way down. The king salmon or chinook, or whatever you want to call it, is way down in all our rivers. Uh, we don't know why, and we don't believe there's any activity in the rivers that are causing it. But I know we're not catching like we used to uh, because we can't. They're not there. We have, we have to figure this out. We have to work on it, make sure that there's not something going on. Is it climate change? Are they moving north? Is there a nuclear sub stuck out there somewhere? Um, everybody laughs at me, but at one time, I counted 64 nuclear subs from Russia. Uh, we had tra kept track of them because they came off the coast of California. And I don't know. That's what we don't know. And I think we got to put a little more research into it. No, it should be more active in the ocean to make sure that the pollution is occurring out there. Is that a cause? Of it? Is the predators? All these different things we haven't answered. And I think it's our role in Congress to do so. Well, see, I knew if we drew you out a little, we'd get something interesting and colorful. So thank you for that, Don, and uh, for your leadership on these bills. Um, the chair will now recognize Representative Dingell for her statement on Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Thank you, Chairman Huffman and Ranking Member Bentz for convening today's hearing uh, and putting the Recovering America's Wildlife Act on the agenda for discussion. And it's always an honor to follow my colleague, Don Young, who, um, uh, you know what? He reminds me of John Dingle more than any of you can ever know. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm proud to talk about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act bipartisan legislation, which I introduced with my colleague, Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, to address our nation's biodiversity crisis. And it is a crisis, my friends. <clears throat> An estimated one third of America's wildlife species, species are at an increased risk of extinction. We're seeing the impact of this on bird populations, which have declined almost 30% in the United States and Canada since 1970. In Michigan and throughout this country, over 40% of freshwater fish are at risk. We're, and so in my home state, known as the Great Lakes State, we're facing unprecedented threats to our environmental heritage. The cost of inaction is immense. The longer we wait to address these issues, the more resources we will ultimately need to safeguard our nation's wildlife. Bold action is needed. And the Recovering America's Wildlife Act meets the moment by funding proactive on the ground conservation efforts to meet the scale of the challenge we face. The legislation provides approximately $1.4 billion in dedicated annual funding to the states, territories, and Native American tribes for proactive conservation efforts for the approximately 12,000 species of wildlife and plants that have been identified under federally approved state wildlife action plans. This historic investment in our nation's wildlife will pay significant dividends. It will allow states to take proactive action that will prevent at-risk species from becoming endangered. And it gives states the power. That's what this does. It empowers the states. It'll grow our $887 billion, billion outdoor economy 
that supports 7.6 million jobs and is fueled by more than 100 and million American hunters, anglers, birders, hikers, and other wildlife enthusiasts. It also supports targeted efforts for our nation's most at-risk species and includes innovative conservation measures to safeguard America's wildlife. And what's really remarkable is that the Recovering America's Wildlife Act has the support of this very broad spectrum of organizations, leading conservation organizations, sportsmen's groups, environmental advocates, and businesses for good reason. It utilizes proven, proven funding mechanism, mechanisms, boldly addresses pressing conservation needs, and prevents the need for more costly interventions in the future. We passed this bill in the Natural Resources Committee last Congress by a vote of 26 to 6. The majority of Democrats and Republicans voted for it. The updated version of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act includes improvements, including made in the last Congress's manager's amendment, which further strengthens the provisions in this bill. We have a conservation, economic, and moral rationale to, to, to act in order to protect and recover America's wildlife for future generations. This is an opportunity to take historic action to address a pressing conservation need. And I strongly urge my colleagues to support this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the gentlelady from Michigan. Uh, I want to commend you, uh, Representative Dingell, for your dedication and hard work over several years on this really important legislation. We'll now recognize uh, my colleague, Representative Panetta, from uh, the Central Coast of California, uh, maybe the second or third most beautiful congressional district in America. Uh, but he has a bill uh, known as the Monarch Act. and. Uh, as I uh, recognize you for five minutes, uh, Congressman Panetta, let me just say that I have been to the uh, the Monarch Preserve in Pacific Grove with my family. We were there when there were monarchs. In fact, uh, not too long ago, I think 47,000 monarchs were counted at that preserve. Sadly, in January of this year, the count was zero. So uh, there is some urgency to this subject matter, and I, I welcome you for five minutes to tell us about your bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity and thank you for highlighting that very important st uh, statistic uh, and is basically why I'm here in front of you today. Also, uh, I appreciate, uh, Chairman, uh, you acknowledging that your district is the second or third most beautiful behind the Central Coast of California, uh, the 20th Congressional District. So I appreciate you saying that as well. I uh, also want to acknowledge Ranking Member Benz and all of the members of the subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you again for holding this very important hearing today and for giving me this opportunity to testify in support of the bipartisan Monarch Action Recovery and Conservation of Habitat Act. Yes, otherwise known as a perfect acronym, the Monarch Act for short. Um, I wanna also recognize one of our experts that's gonna be testifying, Dr. Erica Zavaleta, Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz in my district, and thank her and all of the panelists for taking time to share their expertise with us today. As you heard, uh, I represent the Central Coast of California. It's a place where I grew up. It's a place where I have always called home. And I can tell you as a kid, we knew that one of the symbols of our home, of who we are, was a Western monarch butterfly. In fact, the town of Pacific Grove is officially known as Butterfly City, USA. Also in my district, there are four of the top 10 high priority sites where Western monarch butterflies overwinter during their incredible 3000 mile annual migration. Now, we recently, just as a chairman, I went to two of those but, uh, monarch butterfly sanctuaries in PG, Pacific Grove, and Santa Cruz, places that I visited as a kid. And let me tell you, back then, you would go there and you would feel like you were swimming in tens of thousands of monarch butterflies that were all around you. But on the recent visits that I did, I saw at the most maybe five monarch butterflies. That experience is reflective of a larger disturbing trend. According to official studies from the field, fewer than 2,000 monarch butterflies returned to their wintering grounds along the West Coast compared to just 20 years ago when millions returned every winter. Those numbers reflect a staggering reality that the Western monarch butterfly population has declined by more than 99% since the 1980s. And that number demonstrates that this population is now officially at imminent risk 
of extinction. And yes, similar to the other effects of climate change that we're experiencing, we don't act now, it will be too late. Not just for our Western monarchs, but it will affect our food supply. As you know, but bears repeating, monarchs are pollinators. And if we don't take action now, we're setting ourselves up for the collapse of an ecosystem that will impact not just our environment, but our food security. I believe that we can reverse course on this decline, save the Western monarch butterfly, but also ensure its continued important role in our ecosystems, our history, and our culture. That's why I introduced the Monarch Act, legislation that would address the recovery efforts of this species by creating a Western Monarch Butterfly Rescue Fund, a fund that would direct key federal resources to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and authorize $125 million for critical activities to revive Western Monarch habitats like planting native milkweed and nectar species. I also want to take this time, Mr. Chairman, to take this opportunity to, uh, to call on Secretary Holland and the Department of Interior to use the emergency authority under the Endangered Species Act to list the monarch butterfly to open up additional necessary resources. I do believe that it's that type of emergency protection that is absolutely necessary so that the Western monarchs have a chance to survive this summer and start to rebuild its population. I believe that we must pursue every action available to us, including actions made possible by an ESA listing and the actions outlined in my Monarch Act. In doing so, we can afford those who come after us an opportunity, like our children, for them to swim with the monarchs, for our farmers to benefit from the pollinators, and for all of us to experience the spectacular beauty, the special migration, and the profound role that Western monarch butterflies play in all of our homes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and we'll now recognize Representative Stephanie Murphy from Florida for her statement on the Marine Mammal Research and Response Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and uh, Chairman uh, Huffman and Ranking Member um, Bentz. Uh, just thank you so much for the opportunity to speak about my bipartisan bill, H.R. 2848, the Marine Mammal Research and Response Act. I introduced this bill with Congressman Brian Mast of Florida and Congresswoman uh, Marilyn Strickland of Washington State. The bill's co-sponsors are evenly divided between, between Democrats and Republicans, and an identical bill was introduced by Senator Maria Cantwell and unanimously approved by the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation on May 12th. In summary, um, this bill would strengthen the federal government's ability to protect beloved marine mammals like manatees, dolphins, seals, and whales. Specifically, the bill would authorize increased funding for two key initiatives, the Unusual Mortality Event Fund and the Prescott Marine Mammal Rescue Assistance Grant Program. The federal government uses these accounts to support efforts by local governments and nonprofit organizations to rescue and rehabilitate sick or injured marine mammals and to research what's causing them to become sick or injured in the first place. And one of the main reasons I chose to file this bill is to better understand and to help stop the rapid die-off of manatees in my home state of Florida. You know, this phenomenal, phenomenon is deeply concerning to my constituents and to advocacy groups across the nation. And the statistics are staggering. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission has reported 881 manatee deaths between January 1st and July 23rd of this year. That's the highest death toll ever recorded in a single year. And we still have five months remaining in 2021. And so back in March, I urged the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to declare this record die-off as an unusual mortality event, or a UME, which is a sudden and significant surge in deaths of marine mammal species. And to its credit, the Fish and Wildlife Service quickly made this official designation. And that de declaration unlocked federal funding in the Unusual Mortality Event Fund so it could be used to reimburse the Florida government and nonprofit organizations for efforts they undertake to save manatees and nurse them back to health. And our bill would authorize additional funding for this very important account so that the federal government can respond to UM UMEs like the one we have witnessed in Florida wherever and whenever they occur. Our bill also authorizes increased funding for the Prescott Grant Program, which is the federal government, um, which is a program the federal government uses to provide competitive grants to uh, stranding network organizations to rescue, rehabilitate, or investigate distressed marine mammals. In addition, in addition, our bill would help local governments and nonprofit organizations quickly access federal funding to treat marine mammals with emergency health conditions even before a UME is declared. It would do this by creating a marine mammal, marine mammal rescue and rapid response fund. 
Finally, our bill establishes a marine mammal health monitoring and analysis platform to collect and report data regarding marine mammal deaths. And it directs the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine to study marine mammal mortality events. These actions will advance the effort to protect these animals through science. If manatees continue to die at such high numbers, experts fear the species could decline to near extinction levels. The federal government must do more to protect these majestic creatures and all other threatened marine mammals. And I believe passage of our legislation is the best way to do that. I hope we can swiftly enact this bill into law. Thank you and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady from Florida and, and uh, want to commend you and Congressman Mast for uh, undertaking this important work. Uh, the committee will now recognize Representative Blumenauer of Oregon for his statement on the Captive Primate Safety Act. Thank you. you. There you go. Okay, we can hear you just fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ranking Member Bents, it's it's good to see Chairman Grahava uh, on the call. Uh, um, I deeply appreciate an opportunity to share with you uh, some comments about the Captive Primate Safety Act. It would amend the Lacey Act amendments of 1981 to prohibit the interstate commerce and private ownership of non-human primates so that these animals can no longer be kept as pets. Most people cannot provide the special care, housing, and social structure these animals require, putting their welfare at risk. But even if you're not a huge fan of animal welfare, you ought to be concerned about human welfare, because this behavior puts human at risk, either from the transmission of zoonomic diseases or serious injury or death. When primates reach adolescence, they often demonstrate aggression towards those who they perceive as lower ranking members of their troop. When kept as pets, this means these teenagers can inflict great physical harm on children, friends, and neighbors. Just last month in Eastern Oregon, a woman was attacked by her 200 pound pet chimpanzee. The chimpanzee had to be shot and the woman and her mother sustained injuries to their torso, arms, and legs. There are no winners in this situation. Two people are injured. First responders were put at risk dealing with an, a, a, a wild animal. And that animal was killed for expressing normal, normal behaviors after a lifetime of captivity. Unfortunately, there are many more examples of highly publicized primate attacks. In 2009, Another woman in Stamford, Connecticut, was brutally attacked by a neighbor's pet chimpanzee, despite the fact it's illegal to own primates as pets in Connecticut, and that the chip had previously displayed aggressive behavior. This woman was on Capitol Hill, Charla Nash, her face and hands ripped off by the chimpanzee and left her horribly disfigured. She even lost her sight due to a disease that was transmitted by this chimpanzee. I was happy that Charlie was one of the first people to receive a full face transplant. Uh, it was it helped her with her recovery, um, but she continues to be affected by this incident and no amount of reconstructive surgery is going to put it right. These incidents and many, many more illustrate that primates are wild animals, not pets. If this seems familiar, it's because this bill passed the House of Representatives with overwhelming support under the suspension of the rules in the 110th and 111th Congress. In fact, we voted on this legislation just a week after Charla Nash was attacked in 2009. Since this incident, Charla has been a public advocate for the legislation, but Congress has yet to act to get it across the finish line. Uh, and she's not the only victim. Since 1990, approximately 300 people have reported being injured by primates, most kept by private individuals. And many, many more incidents are likely unre unreported. Uh, some want to argue that this is uh, unnecessary, that the states have laws to restrict this practice. As I mentioned, Connecticut had a law on the books, and it didn't save Charlie. And the state laws vary wildly 
from a complete ban on pet primates to bans on specific, because it's a patchwork of laws. The Captive Primate Safety Act will strengthen existing state laws and create a federal framework for the protection of licensing and enforcement. This legislation has passed the House uh, and your committee only to die a lingering death in the Senate. There's a new order in the Senate this time, and my colleague, Senator Blumenthal, I think can be able to get it across the finish line if you will help us by moving it forward. I deeply appreciate your time and attention today, the past work the committee has done, and I hope you will help us get it across the finish line now. Thank you for your courtesy, and I welcome any comments or questions you might have. I thank the gentleman from Oregon, and uh, we will now transition to our second uh, panel to hear testimony from the administration. So under committee rules, uh, I ask our witnesses to limit oral statements to five minutes, but uh, your entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin to speak, the timer will start counting down. It turns orange when you have one minute remaining. I recommend that members and witnesses uh, who are joining remotely use the grid view in WebEx so that they can lock the timer on their screen. Uh, after our witnesses complete their testimony, uh, each of you is, is, at, is reminded to mute yourself to avoid inadvertent background noise, and I'll allow all the witnesses to finish before we begin our questions. So our first witness uh, is Ms. Janet Coit, Assistant Administrator of National Marine Fisheries Service, Acting Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and Deputy NOAA Administrator. Uh, we, we will then hear a testimony from Mr. St uh, Stephen Gurton, Deputy Director for Program Management and Policy at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Coit to testify for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Huffman. Good morning, members of the subcommittee. Um, it's nice to see you, uh, Chair Grijalva. I look forward to meeting you. Um, as mentioned, my name is Janet Coit, and I'm the Assistant Administrator for NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service. While I'm about a month into my new position, and I'm still getting up to speed on many important issues, I'm just thrilled to join NOAA and work with the agency's skilled and dedicated employees. And I'm very eager to work with you to improve conservation and management of natural resources. It seems auspicious that my first congressional hearing is before a subcommittee called WOW. So. Uh, now I'll turn to some of the bills, and I look forward to continuing our dialogue today and in the weeks and months to come. Uh, first, the Marine Mammal Research and Response Act. This legislation would build upon the foundation of the successful Prescott Grant Program implemented by NOAA in 2002. Um, as you know, the Prescott Program funds are used to expand response capacity for stranded marine mammals, to increase the data collection for investigations into strandings and entanglements, and the cause of mortality, and to build and upgrade facilities for rehabilitating marine mammals. In my home state of Rhode Island, uh, in part due to COVID, um, my former agency, Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, um, led the response on 32 marine mammal stranding. Got funds. Uh, they offer critical support for that kind of effort, and the amendments in this bill would benefit the National Stranding Network. Regarding the Illegal Fishing and Forced Labor Prevention Act, NOAA is committed to combating illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. In Mr. Products. Chairman. Uh, does the gentleman have a question, a point of inquiry? <laughs> nice try, friend. How are uh, you? Earl, you, are, you need to mute. And uh, Ms. Coit, I apologize for that interruption, and we'll, we'll throw a little time back on the clock and let you continue. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this work is central to our mission, and it's a priority for me. Uh, NOAA is working hard on many fronts, bilateral, multilateral engagements to track, prevent, and enforce against illegal fishing activity. The United States strongly condemns labor abuses of any kind through the seafood supply chain, and we all support the need for decent work conditions within the fishing industry. NOAA works with our interagency partners, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, Labor, State, and others, to combat illegal labor practices, including forced labor and fisheries. I commit to working with you in this committee and to engaging with the full scope of federal agencies involved in this whole of government approach that's needed to combat labor abuses, IUU fishing, and seafood fraud. 
NOAA employs a wide range of tools to influence how other nations address IUU fishing and fish products and to work to ensure parity for U.S. stakeholders who are disadvantaged by illegal fishing and, of course, to support the broader objective to sustainably manage shared fisheries and international living marine resources. Over the past few years, um, NOAA set up and deployed the Seafood Import Monitoring Program, known as SIMP. Uh, this is a risk-based traceability program. It establishes reporting and record-keeping requirements that are needed to prevent imported IOU fish and fish products or misrepresented seafood from entering U.S. commerce. SIMP serves as both a screening tool and a deterrent. And be assured that NOAA coordinates closely with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection in these efforts. While SIMP is focused on the proof and accuracy of the permits and the content, in many occasions, SIMP inspections have uncovered additional violations and led to further enforcement actions. Currently, the scope of SIMP extends to almost half of all imported seafood, covering the species groups most likely to be affected by IUU fishing. NOAA will reevaluate our initial risk assessments and our approach and very likely include more species in SIMP as the program matures beyond this nascent stage. Shifting gears, uh, the Keep Keeping Ecosystems Living and Protected Act, the KELP Act, would provide a new federal grant program aimed at preventing the loss of vital kelp ecosystems along the West Coast. You pointed out, Mr. Chair, um, the dramatic loss in these uh, ecosystems over just the past 10 years. So NOAA will continue to work with our partners and we're actively researching kelp ecosystem dynamics to help manage, uh, help states manage and identify priorities um, and to restore kelp and abalone throughout planting. We welcome the opportunity to build on our existing partnerships to develop additional expertise and share it and to devote resources toward the kelp restoration effort. Finally, uh, NOAA's work uh, currently is well aligned with the objectives of the Safeguarding America's Future and Environment Act. This bill aims to reduce increased risks from extreme weather and other climate change impacts by protecting, restoring, and managing natural resources and improving coordination across the federal government. NOAA continues to apply the latest science to assess climate impacts on fish and other protected species, as well as to identify and implement adaptation and ocean-based climate solutions. NOAA is working to gather data and to integrate that information on climate and ecosystem changes into management decisions. NOAA is proud to continue to lead the world in conducting ocean and climate science, serving the nation's coastal communities and industries, and ensuring responsible stewardship of our ocean and coastal resources. It's a privilege to be in this position, and I value the opportunity to continue working with the subcommittee on these important issues. Thank you for your Thank leadership, you. and I look forward to the questions and uh, discussion today. Thank you, Ms. Coit. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Gerton from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Bentz, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Steve Gruden, Deputy Director for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on several bills addressing fish and wildlife conservation. Our mission is working with others to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. We conserve and protect our trust resources by implementing environmental laws and treaties, including several related to today's hearing. As our planet faces a mounting biodiversity crisis, rapidly warming climate, and other conservation challenges, our work is as important as it's ever been. We need to halt species declines, strategically conserve and restore habitat, and enhance the resilience of wildlife and people to climate change both in the U.S. and across the globe. We greatly appreciate the subcommittee's interest in the wildlife conservation bills being considered today. These bills would boost funding authorizations for the service and its partners to address declining biodiversity and the effects of climate change. They would also enhance collaboration and coordination. Our written testimony discusses the department's views on each of these bills. My opening remarks can't address all of them, so I will provide brief remarks to summarize those views. We support the intent of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act 2021, which would equip states, territories, and tribes with more than 1.3 billion annually to address the needs of more than 12,000 species of greatest conservation concern. This legislation would enable our country to take a giant step forward in combating species declines nationwide. For over 80 years, we've supported the state's management of their trust natural resources by administering the highly effective 
and durable wildlife and sport fish restoration programs and other targeted grant programs designed to benefit fish and wildlife. Building on this work, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act to provide new funding to address a backlog of conservation work identified in state wildlife action plans. Longstanding grant programs are not targeted to this work, so there's a gap in the ability of the states to tackle the backlog. The Recovery in America's Wildlife Act presents a unique and timely opportunity to equip our state partners to holistically conserve their natural resources. It provides similar support to Native American tribes and the territories. This can provide key support to mitigate the effects of the climate crisis and wildlife population declines that threaten our lands and communities. We support the Highlands Conservation Act to provide financial assistance to our partners and strengthen the service's ability to conserve wildlife in their habitats. The Highlands Conservation Act is a partnership grant program with the states to strategically conserve land in the Highlands region. that comprises about 3.4 million acres of biologically diverse landscapes that provide many opportunities. The service also supports the intent of the Marine Mammal Research and Response Act to strengthen efforts to protect and preserve marine mammals as it pertains to our work. This will provide financial assistance for rescue and rehabilitation and further enhance our partner's capacity to respond to emergency events. These reauthorizations and revisions will greatly enhance our ongoing efforts with our partners. We support the goals of the other bills related to the service that the subcommittee is discussing today. These bills would create species-specific grant programs, assist wildlife and climate adaptation, address emerging threats in wildlife population, and target conservation enforcement actions in the U.S. and abroad. We greatly appreciate the bill's sponsors and subcommittee's interest in advancing conservation and climate action. We're committed to providing the science-driven leadership and expertise to tackle these issues with our domestic and international partners. However, addressing challenges of such great scale requires a commitment of resources of equal magnitude. Without sufficient funding to design and deliver science-based conservation with our partners, we believe the service, the service should have discretion to prioritize funding among the many competing wildlife conservation needs. Congress has provided broad authorities to the service to conserve and manage species at home and abroad. And for more than a century, these authorities have succeeded in maintaining the wildlife heritage for many generations of America. We want to ensure we're able to continue using our science-based approach to target these resources. We appreciate the subcommittee's interest in furthering wildlife conservation, and we stand ready work with the subcommittee as you consider these and other fish and wildlife conservation and management bills. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gurton. Uh, before we go to questions, uh, I will ask unanimous consent to enter a statement for the record from the U.S. Custom and Border Protection Agency on uh, my illegal fishing bill uh, with Mr. Graves. We have worked closely with uh, Customs and Border Protection on this legislation, and I appreciate their positive uh, statement. So without objection, uh, that will be entered into the record. And I'll now recognize myself for uh, questions from the first panel. And uh, I'd like to begin with Ms. Coy. Uh, Ms. Coy, you, you may be aware that Congress has, has directed NOAA several times now to expand the very limited definition of IUU fishing that the agency's been using. Uh, so that it would include forced labor and human rights violations. Most recently, uh, in fiscal year 2021, in our appropriations bill, we directed NOAA to revise that definition within 90 days after enactment. Uh, that omnibus appropriations bill was enacted on December 27th. But uh, to my knowledge, we have yet to see an updated definition. So very specific question here. Uh, when will the draft rule on the IUU definition be released for public comment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, let me start by saying that no one in this country wants to eat seafood caught with forced labor. Um, so I realize what a serious problem it is in the fishing sector and that we need to do more um, to address that unconscionable exploitation of people. In terms of the draft rule, I will be honest that I am not sure when that will emerge from the process. Um, the decisions on and the definition are not uh, NOAA alone to make. It's part of a conversation across the administration. And I know that there, that conversation is happening now um, with the Biden administration um, discussing how best uh, to approach the definition and the broader panoply of work to combat IUU. So I 
don't have a specific answer and you ask me a specific question, um, but I'll do my best uh, to find out when that draft rule will be made public. And well, thank, thank you, Ms. Coyd. And, and look, I, I do appreciate the general supportive statements that have been offered uh, on this issue, but uh, there's nothing like actually taking action and Congress has directed you to do that. So I think there really is an obligation on the administration. I know you're new to the position and there's always challenges with the handoff from one administration to the other, but we need to see that new definition. And I don't wanna be talking about this uh, months and years down the road. So thank you for your responsiveness on that. Uh, the requirement currently uh, in the law for the SIMP program uh, for traceability and reporting applies to only about 40% of seafood imports. And uh, I mentioned an international report recently that found we imported about $2.4 billion worth of seafood that comes straight out of this terrible IUU fishing uh, industry. Um, this is despite the existence of our SIMP program that's supposed to address this problem. So we have work to do. Uh, the Joint U.S. Government tax Task Force on Combating IUU Fishing and Seafood Fraud uh, under the Obama administration noted that it's the goal of the U.S. government to eventually expand the program to all seafood at first point of sale or import, and that the species that were listed back in 2016 are just the first step in a comprehensive program of reporting on all seafood imports. So again, we need to expand SIMP to cover all seafood imports our legislation proposes that we do that. I, I wanna ask another very specific question. Will NOAA commit to expanding the application of SIMP to all seafood and making this commitment within the first year uh, of your tenure? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you note, it's, uh, I'm a few weeks into this position and um, the NOAA is reevaluating the species that are currently covered, which make up about half of all the imported uh, seafood species into the U.S. Um, you've got to walk before you can run, and we've just stood up this program in the last few years, and um, I think um, are very proud of the work we've done to date. Uh, the review, the periodic reviews will definitely increase um, the number of species on that list, and I know the goal of the report that you're referencing is to have all species covered under SIMP, um, so that's something I will uh, discuss further with folks here at Commerce and across the administration. I appreciate that, but I, I do want to urge you in the administration to make that commitment. We, we need to see that commitment. Uh, this problem has been with us for far too long, and it's time for action. So uh, last question for me, uh, a little bit of a softball. Can you uh, explain the co-benefits of restoring kelp forest ecosystems? It's more than just kelp, isn't it? Yes, uh, thank you. I'm really eager to work with you on continuing to restore these important ecosystems. They're, so they're important, of course, for a whole uh, variety of species that count on kelp uh, forests for refuge um, and also for food. So there's a wide, it's the whole uh, ecosystem, invertebrates, fish, marine mammals, and they're also incredibly important for uh, the resilience of your coastlines. Um, they buffer the wave action and help protect coastal communities. Uh, so both for ecological reasons and economical reasons, um, these ecosystems are critical. Thank you very much, Ms. Coit. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ranking Member Bentz for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, thank you to the two witnesses. Uh, first of all, I just want to comment uh, and thank uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Coit for or the conversation we enjoyed yesterday uh, in in uh, discussing various issues that I think are going to come before uh, her in the in the uh, in her future in, in her new position. And of course, uh, I'm looking forward to further discussing the uh, focus on more balance when it comes to implementing the ESA. And I know she's an expert in that space, uh, but uh, in, term, in terms of its application in drought-stricken areas such as, such as Oregon. And of course, uh, uh, and also a little more focus and perhaps um, uh, more detail on the causal relationships between uh, activities inland and those in the ocean. So I'm looking forward to those further discussions. Now my questions are actually to Mr. Girton and they have to do with the monarch butterfly CCAA. And my question, Mr. Girton, is whether or not you can commit your service to preserving and perhaps growing the monarch butterfly CCAA. 
Thank you for your question, Mr. Bensoff. The monarch butterfly is an extremely important species for the service and the states and uh, all of our conservation partners. As you know, uh, we have proposed it uh, for listing, but it has been concluded at this time. We're continuing to work with the states, landowners, and we did, in fact, stand up a CCAA uh, last year, particularly with some of our energy sector partners. Uh, we're very interested in exploring how we can make that CCA more stronger more robust and how it can contribute to all of our collective interest in conserving the monarch butterfly. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, uh, sadly, your, your testimony is a little, a little um, mooshed out, but I think you said that you were, you were going to be supporting the monarch butterfly CCAA. Is that what I heard? Yes, sir. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Sorry about that. So the, the answer then is, you, you will be committing, or the service, the service will commit to preserving and growing that CCAA. The reason this is so important to me personally is that I had a great deal to do with CCAAs in the uh, Oregon sage grouse uh, discussions and many of the folks in my district ended up entering into CCAAs uh, all to the benefit of, of the sage grouse. So I'm just, I saw, I see them working in that uh, space and I'm just uh, anxious to hear that, that the uh, service will be doing its best uh, to help re use that device, which I believe is a very, very good one, very effective one in, in trying to recover the monarch butterfly, something we all, all uh, support. Uh, so what, what are you doing to actively encourage more enrollment in the CCAA for the monarch butterfly? So what we're doing, uh, can you hear me better now, sir? What we are doing is working with all of our partners under several mechanisms. There is a very large monarch conservation fund under the auspices of the National Fish and Wildlife Fund that has a lot of uh, capacity, about $13 million so far for monarch conservation. Our budget requests about $5 million, primarily for conservation partnership activities, such as expansion of the CCA program, investments in the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program. A lot of these are to work with uh, private sector, private landowners and others to get more and more of that pump we can behind the uh, larger issue of monarch conservation. Well, thank you. I'm very, very happy, very happy to hear that. And I would, I would just encourage further use of those devices because uh, they, they were accepted by the communities up in Oregon and, and they work. So with that, uh, with that, uh, those encouraging words, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Benz. Uh, the chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Grijalva, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to, uh, for the hearing and uh, and your comments regarding the, the issue of illegal uh, seafood in the, in the food chain, and, and, and you laid that out already, and, and, and of course, the slave forced labor issue. And uh, just want to reiterate that point. And, Thank our congressional colleagues for the pieces of legislation, uh, and uh, and let me just ask Ms. Clayton. You, I think the what Mr. Huff, let me just associate myself with something that Mr. Hubbard said. The, the we are, I think that we have an understanding that you know uh, you're going into a position, and congratulations. But NOAA is in a very key place that, to deal with those two issues that Mr. Huffman and others, but those two that he brought up, and. Uh, and there has been an urgency to this, and I understand you're inheriting a rather lax enforcement and uh, fact-based uh, response to things uh, in, uh, in, in the agency, but uh, there is an urgency here. And, and I, and I, I is Noah, uh, is Noah committed to, to the issue of illegal fishing and forced labor in terms of using all its powers uh, to address that? And, and that's a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, Noah and I am com uh, and uh, are committed to using all of our powers to address forced labor. As you know, under the Maritime Safe Act, there is an interagency work group on IUU um, fishing and fish products, and Noah is currently uh, one of the three co-chairs, the first lead chair on that. And um, I, I just want to say that I, I see. I see I see your your 
your agency and where you are now as being the lead in that discussion for, mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. And and and, uh, uh, and I think Noah has the agency to step, to step up and lead that uh, because uh, uh, I, I, that's the critical point. And, and using all our powers by that, I mean, even identifying uh, how to stop seafood from entering the country and, and Noah using that authority which they have to do that. Uh, that's the point I'm making, and, and, and uh, I appreciate it, and I welcome, and congratulations on your appointment, and uh, and this urgency issue is, is, is a persistent one, and and, and uh, as Mr. Hoffman said, we lip service is not going to work for with, with the committee anymore, so uh, I appreciate it. You, you inherited that lip service, and I hope you can dramatically change that quickly. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your um, advice and your leadership. And I want to thank you, uh, Chairman Grijalva, and uh, I hope that our mutual feeling of exasperation and frustration is coming through loud and clear, despite whatever audio issues we might have uh, with the remote <laughs> hearing. Uh, so with that, uh, the chair will recognize uh, Mr. Case for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Coit, um, your your friends and and uh, fans um, extend all the way to Hawaii. So congratulations uh, on your on your appointment. Uh, we look forward to working with you out in the Pacific, even though you're you're more experienced with gray water than uh, blue water. But uh, we think you'll get uh, familiar with it. Um, I want to stay on Chair Hoffman's questions uh, because uh, to me, IUU is absolutely critical. Um, and uh, by the way, these are all. I mean, it's really encouraging to see this this assortment of bills on a bipartisan basis. So I don't want to downplay any of the other bills, uh, many of which I've co-sponsored. But I do want to focus in particular on HR 3075 because that's a kind of our IUU uh, vehicle or or opportunity to 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 improve IUU. A couple of questions. Um, um, first of all, um, I believe that NOAA owes us the um, uh, report. Um, uh, on IUU countries um, under the um, High Seas Drift, High Seas Drift Net Fishing Moratorium Protection Act, under which um, you are supposed to report to Congress uh, every couple of years on IUU. I think it was due in June. So, very specific question: Where is that report? Uh, thank you, and I look forward to meeting you and visiting your beautiful district. That report should be coming for, uh, forth within the next couple of weeks. Um, so it is being, it's under its final review and we should have it to you and would look forward to reviewing it specifically with this subcommittee. Okay, well, I think that report is critical. Um, and in all honesty, um, uh, fr from my perspective, um, somehow that report, in, in my view at least, has not adequately reflected the degree of IUU throughout the country, I, I mean, throughout the world. I mean, there are numerous international reports by by NGOs and others that indicate a far greater uh, number of countries that are IUU countries than the three that have been reported, um, you know, in, in the most recent report. Uh, some reports are 50 plus countries. And I mean, anecdotally, we all know this in the Pacific. I mean, you can count, you can count up to three in two seconds uh, in the Pacific on, on IUU and then keep going for quite a while. And so somehow that report is 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 missing the boat. Um, and 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 you, you will uh, recall that uh, uh, some of the massaging that Congress did to that act um, indicated that if a country has one instance of IUU, uh, they should be going on that list. Um, and so um, ca can you assure us that um, uh, you'll take an, your own personal, um, you know, new, um, new administrative perspective to it and, and ask the, the hard question, which is why aren't we adequately reflecting um, IUU on, on the primary report that we use for, for our actions uh, to take on IUU. Uh, Congressman, I assure you that uh, I will uh, take a lead role and I believe you will find this report includes um, more countries when it comes out. And I want to uh, also mention that both my own team and your um, council chair have mentioned the illegal fishing as one of the problems we really need to tackle in the Pacific. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, the seafood import monitoring program, SIMP, and you, 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 uh, which, which you know, I think we all support. Um, you talked about cost benefit. 
uh, in terms of the uh, application of SIMP and, and basically in so many words, as I understood your testimony said, hey, you know, we can expand it, but uh, we, we have a kind of a zero, zero budget game that we're playing. And, and so first of all, correct me if I'm wrong, but second, I mean, how can we resource you more uh, so that you actually are able to, um, are, there, are there statutory or regulatory efficiencies you need to pursue? Are there, are there changes that we can help you with that would somehow uh, give you a far uh, greater reach off of, of that program because that, that actually allows you to follow up on the IUU um, identified? Uh, thank you. And I know the FY22 budget increases uh, funding for NOAA in a way that would be very meaningful if that um, increase is sustained. In terms of specifics, I'd like to get back to you on inter uh, allocating funds to SIMP. Um, I know that it was initially a risk-based program and we picked what we thought were the, based on criteria and a review and transparency, but you know, what were the most effective places to focus but are definitely reviewing that now and will periodically to expand. And I, and I um, know expanding a program usually comes with additional resources or reprioritization, but in order to give you a specific answer, I'd like to get back to you. Okay, and because my time has expired, I'll just give this last one as a comment. And that is um, that the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, just published a draft food traceability rule, um, which relates to uh, illegal uh, food in our country and um, to their credit included seafood. Uh, we are, we are um, communicating with FDA on expanding uh, their, their seafood range, but I would encourage you if you're not already to coordinate with the FDA um, on tracing um, IUU once it gets into our country. Thank you. Thank the gentleman from Hawaii, and the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Cohen from Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm here, and I appreciate your holding this hearing and your uh, steadfastness on all these issues that are of such importance to us. Uh, Mrs. Coit, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, the uh, Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services uh, published by the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, a good place to have it published, cited unsustainable fishing as the primary driver of marine diversity loss over the past 50 years. For billions of people who rely on the oceans for food, including same moi, the report authors emphasize, authors emphasize the critical importance of stopping illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and of enforcement of the natural resources laws that are already on the books. The High Sea Drift Net Fishing Moratorium Protection Act better known as HSDFMMPA, huh, right, is one such law. For example, in 2019, despite evidence to support identification of our 50 nations and regions engaged in illegal fishing, NF, NMFS identified only three nations that report to Congress. So, Ms. Coyd, I ask you, what barriers prevent uh, NF, NMFS from using the High Seas Drift Net Act to its fullest extent to stop illegal unreported fishing and when can the public expect to see the 2021 report to Congress? Uh, thank you, Congressman. So the report to Congress will be forthcoming very soon. It, it, we're almost at August. I believe you will see it in August um, and that um, we will review it with you and it will, uh, I believe, meet uh, some of the, or address some of the criticisms that several of you have made. Um, and that report will identify you know, nations that have been engaging in illegal fishing practices. And um, similar to the European system, um, Mr. Chair, that you've discussed, it, it gives a sort of a yellow card, an opportunity for people to remedy or address deficiencies, and then we're required to make a um, certification on whether they have addressed those. And let me say that um, we're, I'm so proud of the most sustainably harvested fisheries in the world, which are U.S. fisheries, and worked um, very hard on fisheries issues in my previous job in Rhode Island. And I understand not just the um, exploitation and um, um, in, impact on the environment, but also how that undermines our own uh, fishing industry. And I look forward to working really hard on these issues with you. It will be a focus of mine. I will be personally involved on the interagency task force and working with you. Well, thank you. I'm going to hold you responsible if I go to my store and sea bass or, or swordfish uh, or salmon are not there. And, wh and white salmon, which is the, the province of uh, Mr. Young, that should be there too. Uh, and I'd like to ask Mr. Gurton a question. Uh, 
and I turn our focus to the Captive Primate Safety Act. The International Union for Conservation of Nature and other researchers say that about 75% of wild primate populations are declining. Uh, I see ads on TV that cause tears to flow about no elephants in the future and all those other things to try to make, get you to make a contribution. Uh, it's worse than Congress people. Uh, does the U.S. primate pet ownership have a role in this decline? Thank you for your question, Congressman. The uh, pet trade of non-human primates certainly drives a market that contributes to the decline of wild populations, uh, and the U.S. is part of that pet trade. However, we believe that the primary threat to the conservation of these species globally is the removal of non-primates uh, from the wild. This is uh, poaching, this is bushmeat, this is uh, illegal trafficking. And so for this reason, uh, we focus our law enforcement efforts on the criminal networks and smugglers that traffic these poached animals. Um, we also work very closely with the USDA who do a lot to enforce our animal welfare laws here in the US. Do you think it'd be a good idea to ban people, trophy hunters, men that need their testosterone uh, um, proven to themselves, that go out and shoot and kill animals in Africa and then bring back the heads of the tusks as, as things to put on their walls and prove their, uh, their, um, their, their, lot, their manlyhood to ban them from bringing those type items back into this country? Thank you for your uh, question, Congressman. There's a, a lot of work going on right now to evaluate the administration's uh, position on the importation of trophy imports. As an agency, we certainly support uh, legal hunting regulations and legal conservation actions. And so uh, we'll be uh, glad to provide you and your office uh, updates on behalf of the administration on where the administration will come out on the importation of uh, trophy animals and parts from overseas. The pet primate trade is regulated at the state level, causing a patchwork of systems with no restrictions at full bans on private pet ownership. Why, can you explain, Mr. Gerton, why this might not go far enough and why a federal solution is needed? And so, the gentleman's time has expired, but Mr. Gerton, if you want to just in a couple yeah, seconds. For the, for the record, sir, or, or do you want me to respond? Uh, very quickly, if you have a quick response. Sure. Uh, we try to use our statutes to leverage them against the uh, scale, the, the big operators, and, and not a piecemeal approach. Uh, we closely work with the states. We'd be glad to follow up your office and offer a briefing and provide more details for the record, certainly. Thank All you, right. sir, and I appreciate the indulgence Thank of the you, chairman. Sir. He always does good things and gets across to Paris in a timely fashion. We, we try our best, and I, I enjoyed your... Uh, delving into the testosterone compensation and, and other interesting matters in your questions. So thank you. Um, our first witness in the next, uh, let, let me thank the administration panel. I'm sorry? Soto is next. Oh, I apologize. Mr. Soto, I almost overlooked you, our great colleague from Florida, uh, but you're recognized for five minutes, sir. So the second panel, please don't, don't leave us quite yet. Thanks, Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity. You know, with floods, droughts, heat domes, hurricanes, and increasing endangered species, uh, we see the signs all around. When you have a doctor treating a patient, they could either treat the symptoms or the underlying condition. And I heard earlier today this false framing of it's the fish versus the farmers, which, by the way, we're talking about fishermen and fisherwomen who fish these fish for a livelihood. So it's not fish versus people. It's one industry to help our food supply versus another. And there are people involved in all of this. Or we could treat the underlying condition, which is climate change. And that's where we have to come together in this generational challenge. We're seeing in our own state, red tide that's decimating the fisheries and supply uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and drastically hurting our tourism. You can't spend more than an hour at the beach before you start hacking because of the toxins from this. There was a, a gypsum stack called Piney Point where over 200 million gallons of nutrient-rich water was dumped into the Tampa Bay and uh, the Gulf and it has made red tide explode. That's on top of having issues related to 
our manatees, where we had a huge uh, uh, mortality, unusual and mortality event, as my fellow Floridian Representative Murphy had discussed. Um, so first, uh, Ms. Coit, what are we doing to help with this giant fish kill and red tide? And, and I get in my preface that the state has had some issues. Um, unfortunately, the leadership there is at fault of it. And so we on the federal level we literally need to supplement and help against a lack of leadership on the state level. Uh, what can we do to help out with red tide, our fisheries, and, and help with the environment in the Gulf of Mexico right now? Uh, thank you, Congressman, uh, for that uh, statement. You said a lot there. Um, first, Dr. Spinrad has really emphasized the whole Earth systems and the whole of NOAA approach, and the scientists at NOAA um, are the foremost experts on climate and oceans and adaptation. So working closely with you on these issues uh, is something um, that I think we're doing now and need to continue to do. Uh, I'm proud in Rhode Island of the way we were able to reduce nutrients into Narragansett Bay. And as you mentioned, kind of the, the freshwater, salty land sea connection is a big part of what's happening in the Gulf um, with red tide. Um, specifically, uh, I share your concern about the impact on the fisheries there and know that our science center down in Pascagoula is working with the, the state and state experts I will have to get back to you in terms of being specific about what more we can do now to address what is really a, um, a one of many tragedies in the U.S. right now related to uh, global climate change. Thank you, Ms. Coy. And Mr. Gurton, we, we know we've seen the biggest unusual mortality event in years with the manatee. They were recently lowered down to threatened from endangered. Uh, why is it that they're not now reclassified as endangered again? This is a really important issue for our state. Thank you for your question, Congressman. Uh, we're currently preparing to work on a five-year status review for the manatee next year. We're certainly going to take a look at all the information and mortality event to help frame up our decision for next year. I would note for the record that the threatened uh, endangerment uh, status uh, really carries the same weight of significance and regulatory protection for the species. Uh, we're continuing to work with our partners down in the state, a lot of the NGO groups and others to proactively prepare in the eventuality we have another cold uh, winter and that we see a lot of animals over wintering in the Indian River Lagoon again. We're trying to pre-position a lot of capacity down there and certainly some of the uh, Bills uh, we're talking about today, such as the amendments of the MMPA and the authorization for the new rapid response fund and others, would provide a lot of uh, capacity. Uh, but that said, the service is always willing, like we did this past year, to rededicate several hundred thousand dollars of our base operations fund to pay for manatee restoration recovery efforts and give some of that capacity to the states. But uh, this is a huge issue for the service and our partners, and we're Happy to keep your office informed as we work for uh, planning for the next event and as we work on the regulatory review for the species next year. Thank you, Mr. Gurdon. And as the state fails in its duties, it's more incumbent upon the Biden administration to help us step up. And Chairman, just to end, uh, as we look at capping wells and fixing mines, uh, capping and fixing these gypsum stacks is also going to be an important part of building back better. And I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Soto. And I'll ask the, the second panel to hang in for one more uh, set of questions because the gentlelady from New Mexico is with us. Uh, the chair recognizes Ms. Stansbury for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. I think, you know, it goes without saying that protecting our environment, our ecosystems, and our vulnerable species is vital not only to our communities, but to the well being of our planet. And we are seeing unprecedented challenges in addressing the vitality of our ecosystems and species survival and recovery, including loss of habitat, fragmentation of our ecosystems, and of course, climate change. And it's critical that we deploy all available federal resources and programs in partnership with our states, our tribes, other nations, and our communities to address this uh, issue. So I want to thank all of the sponsors for the bills that have been presented today. And on a personal note, I want to say I actually went to college in California in the Bay Area 
and used to go down to Pacific Grove to see the monarch butterflies. And it's deeply sad to hear the loss of um, such a, a beautiful and amazing um, and ecologically important um, part of our environment. So my question is for Mr. Gerton. Um, I wanna ask about a couple of the bills that are presented today to help support the Fish and Wildlife Service in its mission to protect and recover endangered species. So first on HR 1569, the Critically Endangered Animals uh, Act, which of course is our chairman's bill. Could you talk to us a little bit about why this bill is so important in providing authorization for this program and how you work in partnership um, with communities across the country, uh, sorry, across the world to help with species recovery. Thank you for your question, Congresswoman. Uh, this bill would provide funding specifically to conserve species categorized as endangered, critically endangered, or data deficient on the IUCN red list. Examples may be the painted uh, terrapin and a lot of uh, sturgeon species as well uh, globally. It would also enable funding for other IUCN red list, red list species as well. Uh, we believe these type of resources would be invaluable to this global partnership and would give us a lot of capacity uh, for our international affairs program and others. Uh, we pointed out in our testimony though, there's uh, several of these uh, authorizations for appropriations included uh, under consideration today. We just wanna make sure we work with the committee so that if these become appropriated, they, they don't inadvertently offset our operations account and other things like that. But uh, we certainly support what this uh, legislation is all about and believe it would be a great force multiplier for the global partnership to conserve uh, endangered species worldwide. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to the chairman for bringing this bill forward. You know, I think that not only is it vital that we work to address endangered species across the world because of the ecological impacts, but because the United States is a global citizen it's really important that we participate and, and be a good partner to our friends across the world in those efforts. The second question I wanna ask is about the SAFE Act. And um, my question is how will the SAFE Act help the Fish and Wildlife Service to promote the resilience, survivability and adaptability of our fish and wildlife species in response to climate change? And why is that important in light of what we're seeing on the ground? Sure, the SAFE Act would direct our agency to work with federal, state, and other uh, tribal partners to regularly update and implement the National Fish, Wildlife, and Plant Adaptation Climate Strategy. Uh, this provides a unified, all-government-wide approach. Uh, we note uh, President Biden uh, recently established a new executive order tackling the climate crisis. There's a lot of alignment between the intent of this legislation and what that executive order directs the agencies to do. We also note for the record, uh, the bulk of our requested increase for the 22 budget was aligned as well with some of these overarching uh, policy ambitions. And so we've got increases for our coastal resiliency program, private lands work, candidate conservation, uh, refuge uh, habitat restoration and others. But uh, this would uh, really uh, formalize a lot of the ongoing work and uh, perhaps bring new energy to the effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerton. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, as we're seeing the impacts of climate change across our ecosystems, it's vitally, vitally important that we ensure that the restoration work that we're doing, the ecological work to restore these ecosystems and these species takes climate change into consideration. And so I'm grateful for this bill and the work that our Fish and Wildlife Service and all of our federal agencies are doing to address this need. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stanberry. And I want to thank all the members for their engagement and their questions. And thanks to our administration witnesses for your time. Uh, we look forward to continuing uh, to work with you. Uh, and with that, we will move on to the third panel uh, of expert witnesses. Our first witness will be Mr. Nathan Ricard. He's trade counsel for the Southern Shrimp Alliance. After that, we'll hear from Dr. Erica Zabaleta, Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Then we'll hear from Mr. Colin O'Mara, President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Wildlife Foundation. And then finally, our last witness will be Mr. Justin Johns. And I will recognize uh, his member of Congress, Representative Stauber of Minnesota, to properly introduce him when it comes time for him to testify. 
so let me remind the witnesses in the upcoming panel that under our committee rules, uh, they need to limit their oral statements to five minutes, but their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the lights on the witness table will turn green. After four minutes, the light turns yellow and your time is expired when the light turns red. And all of that is, is uh, gonna happen on the timer and WebEx if you're, I think all of you are joining us online. So you'll see that. And uh, I ask you to uh, wrap up your statement when you get to that red light. Uh, we will hear from the entire panel to testify before we bring it back to uh, the members for questions. So the chair now will recognize Mr. Ricard for five minutes. Good morning, uh, Chair Huffman, Ranking Member Benz, and to all the members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I am Nathan Rickard, a partner at the law firm of Picard, Kent, and Rowe, and trade counsel to the Southern Trip Alliance. The Southern Trip Alliance represents members of the U.S. commercial warm water shrimp fishery operating from North Carolina to Texas. The Alliance's executive director, John Williams, its president, Steve Bosarge, and the officers and directors of the organization are lifelong commercial fishermen. I act as the organization's trade attorney. In that role, I have spent the better part of 15 years validating what members of the shrimp industry have long believed to be true, namely that seafood importers operate largely outside of government regulations and that many of the, these companies will take advantage of any opportunity to increase profits. Because our work is geared towards enforcement, we tend to focus on specific illegal schemes. But two reports issued by two different federal agencies earlier this year provided a much broader sense of the prevalence of IEU seafood in our market. As such, these two reports underscore the vital importance of HR 3075, the Illegal Fishing and Forced Labor Prevention Act. This bipartisan legislation introduced by Chair Huffman and Representative Graves would provide essential enhancements to NOAA Fisheries Enforcement Authority to respond to IEU fishing. Why is HR 3075 necessary? $2.4 billion. That is what the U.S. International Trade Commission estimated as the total value of IEU seafood imported into the United States in 2019, $2.4 billion. The commission estimates that one out of every $10 spent on imported seafood goes to IEU seafood. Food imports were eliminated from the U.S. The agency indicated that compliance with SIMP had deteriorated in 2020 compared to the first two years of the program. NOAA Fisheries observed that 43% of its 1,073 audits last year resulted in findings of noncompliance, and that in one out of every 25 audits conducted, the importer failed to provide any traceability documents in support of the claims made regarding the seafood's origins and import entry. The NOAA Fisheries report also described nationwide operations under, under some local communities. Reflecting that experience, I also serve on California's Fish and Game Commission, where I have my home state make decisions about biodiversity, climate adaptation, and other critical issues. In this hearing, though, I'm speaking not in my role as commissioner, but as a scientist. The first of three linked issues before us are the threats facing unique species of plants and animals around the world. The world's longest lasting legacy of environmental impact will be the species we lose to extinction, whose absence will be detectable for millions of years, and which will never get back once they're gone. The quadrants of them fly by to sustain thousands of species proactively rather than waiting until we have to take extraordinary measures to claw them back from the brink of extinction. The third linked issue here is that climate change could undermine our efforts to conserve wildlife waters and lands if we ignore it. Since the 1950s, most of the US is hotter, losing snowpack, and experiencing more wildfire, extreme storms, floods, coastal inundation, and acidic oceans. Salmon, songbirds, oaks, and pinion pines have recently suffered major heat, smoke, and drought-related die-offs. Going forward, securing forests might call for replanting burned areas with drought-adapted seed from farther south, and recovering cold water fishes might call for focus on rivers that can sustain cold flows even in hotter, drier conditions. The SAFE Act lets us secure investments in wildlife, water, and lands with a coordinated adaptation strategy. A final area is the risk aquaculture can pose to ocean ecosystems and wild fisheries. The best way to protect the oceans, sustain good fisheries jobs, and put food on U.S. plates is well-managed wild fisheries. And we do this well. Today, 89% of U.S. marine fish stocks are recovered or recovering. A cautious approach to fin fish aquaculture would protect these wild fisheries and our coastal oceans from pollution, 
habitat loss, and invasion by domesticated and genetically engineered fishes with the potential to cause widespread and lasting harm. My home state already has banned transgenic and exotic fin fish aquaculture in its oceans. In summary, we have here a sweeping chance to secure critically endangered wildlife, catalyze and climate proof our wildlife stewardship efforts, and secure coastal oceans. I urge the committee to support these bills on behalf of the American people, whose varied and deep connections to wildlife, waters, and lands in the US and abroad make conservation a national priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zavaleta. Uh, next, we'll hear from Mr. Colin Amara, who is the uh, president and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Hoffman. It's good to see, good to see you, sir. Um, and Ranking Member Beth Betts as well, members of the subcommittee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to test, testify before you today on the, on the challenges facing people and wildlife alike and the important solutions that you're all considering today. Um, I can't, frankly, thank this committee and the subcommittee enough for their incredible work it's doing. Um, Chairman Hoffman, your leadership has been spectacular. Uh, Chairman Grijalva as well. And like our, our nation's wildlife is in crisis. Um, from iconic species like the monarch butterfly and the California condor to the Oregon spotted frog and the Chinook salmon, um, one third of all of the fish, wildlife, and plant species are at heightened risk of, of heightened risk of extinction. Three billion fewer birds fly in North American skies than did in 1970. And the US alone, state wildlife agencies have identified more than 12,000 species of greatest conservation need. And these, these challenges are many, as Dr. Zavallotta just said eloquently. Um, fragmented and degraded habitat, invasive species and disease, extreme fire, drought, heat waves, flooding, hurricanes, all are largely fueled by our changing climate, are affecting the wildlife that we love, and forcing us to consider how we skate to where the puck is going to be, as opposed to where it is right now. We need to act quickly um, to ensure that our wildlife can adapt to our rapidly changing world. Doing nothing is, is not an option. And inaction is the ally of extinction. The most strategic action we can take, and I think you're hearing from all the panelists, is to invest in proactive, collaborative species recovery. Um, it's the ultimate ounce of prevention. It's much more cost effective to save species before they require the emergency room protections of the Endangered Species Act when they're be, when, be, when, than when they are on the brink of extinction. And for those species that are already endangered, we need a lot more investment. We need to do a lot more to help them recover. Um, these actions are also good for people. Um, we can create good local jobs in communities across the country, create healthier communities for people. We can reduce regulatory uncertainty for business. Um, we can strengthen our outdoor economy. Um, and we can do all this by investing in, in wildlife. Now, many of the bills you're considering today would help address these challenges and present an opportunity to put Americans back to work to ensure our wildlife heritage can sustain itself for future generations um, while also strengthening local economies. I want to focus first and foremost on the bipartisan recovery of America's Wildlife Act. Um, this is simply the most important piece of wildlife legislation since the Endangered Species Act passed in. Introduced by Debbie Dingell, uh, our amazing congresswoman from Michigan and our great champion, Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, a great conservationist from the state of Nebraska. Uh, there's a complementary bill in the Senate led by Senator Martin Heinrich from New Mexico, Senator Roy Blunt from Missouri. Um, this is a completely bipartisan effort. Um, and the Recovering America's Wildlife Act will reverse these trends by restoring populations of at-risk wildlife through collaborative, on-the-ground, non-regulatory conservation actions led by states, territories, and tribes. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act is bold and bipartisan. It's collaborative and proactive. It will have an immediate impact all across the country without raising taxes or creating new regulations. And just like the Great American Outdoors Act of the last Recovering America's Wildlife Act is legislation that brings people and, and Congress together. It offers a solution that matches the magnitude of the challenges that we face by investing in the collaborative implementation of the state and territorial and tribal wildlife action plans. The bill also provides a historic past due investment in the essential conservation work being done by tribal nations. Um, it's simply the most important opportunity tribal nations have ever had to secure wildlife management. So whether you experience wildlife in the rugged backcountry or just your own backyard um, or in the local park, this bill will help the species that them for future generations. We also need to make sure that funding is being directed towards the species that are already on the brink. Um, and many of the bills today provide incredibly strategic targeted emergency funding to stabilize and recover species like the monarch that are barreling towards extinction. The National Wildlife Federation looks work forward to working with the committee on incredibly important bills like Congressman Panarch Act, uh, Chairman Grahal's Extinction Prevention Act, Chairman Huffman's Kelp Act, 
uh, Congresswoman Murphy's Marine Mammal Research and Response Act. Um, we're also eager, eager to work with the committee on Congressman Young's bills to, uh, to conserve native fish populations. The International Wildlife Conservation Bill that Chairman Huffman and Congressman Jeffries are working on. Uh, Congressman Cartwright's SAFE Act and Congressman Maloney's Highlands Conservation Act. Um, it's not too late to save America's wildlife. Not a moment to waste. Compared to many of the other challenges facing Congress right now, conserving fish and wildlife is actually relatively inexpensive. If you funded all the bills before the committee today, every single one of them, at the full amounts all are being proposed, it's less than one-third percent of the overall funding that Congress is contemplating and in investing in our infrastructure and our economy in the coming months. We urge the committee to work with leadership to ensure that budget instructions and other appropriations include sufficient allocations for wildlife, and we stand ready to help. By passing the Recovering America's Wildlife Act and other pragmatic, cost-effective conservation bills, we can ensure that our children and our grandchildren inherit a full symphony of birds, uh, streams that are teeming with fish, grasslands that are dotted with herds of pronghorn and mule deer. Simply put, when we save wildlife, we save ourselves. Thank you for the opportunity to be with all of you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Amara. Uh, Congressman Stauber, I believe you're with us now to introduce our next witness. Uh, thank you, Chair Huffman and Ranking Member Bentz. Uh, for allowing this testimony. Today, I have the unique pleasure of introducing a witness from Minnesota's 8th Congressional District to the Water, Oceans, and Wildlife Subcommittee. Mr. Justin Johns is not only the CEO of East Central Energy, one of the largest electric cooperatives in our state, but is a community leader representing the best our great district has to offer. Justin holds a Class A Master Electrician License, a Bachelor of Science degree, in business administration and a master's degree in strategic leadership. He is clearly well equipped to, to lead East Central and ensure excellent customer service and power to more than 63,000 cooperative members. Justin, his wife, Chris, and their four children live in Pine City, Minnesota. Along with leading East Central, Justin is a captain of the Pine City Volunteer Fire Department and coaches youth hockey. Justin, thank you for traveling to D.C., and I appreciate your flexibility and willingness to testify today. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Johns, welcome to the committee. You're recognized for five minutes. Do we have Mr. Johns unmuted? Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. All right. Thank you, Chairman Huffman, Representative Stauber, Ranking Member Bentz for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Good morning. And I also appreciate the opportunity to represent electric utilities in general and electric cooperatives in particular. Electric cooperatives have been serving their members for nearly 100 years, and we are forward thinking by our very nature. Whether it's a subject like pollinators, renewable energy, conservation, or safety, cooperatives lead with an open mind and a focus on bringing the best service possible to our members. We live in the communities we serve and we strive for an excellent reputation, not excessive margins. Our cooperative principles guide us in our decision-making and cooperative principle number seven is a commitment to community and the environment. That principle is what guides us in conversations like the one we're having today. Last year, our cooperative East Central Energy embarked on the process of candidate conservation agreement with assurances or CCAA status, and to date, 27 groups have enrolled, representing over 780,000 managed habitat acres. There are another 60 to 70 organizations working toward their agreement, and the potential for habitat enrollment is beyond significant. According to the University of Illinois, they believe there are 2.3 million acres that are suitable for pollinator habitat if enrolled from both electric, electric utilities and departments of transportation. It's important to mention that our agreement is merely the culmination of decades of work identifying, evaluating, and implementing practices that are focused on an alignment of environmental and fiscally sound practices. We acquired our CCAA as an effort to protect our vegetation management practices and to formalize the belief we have in our regenerative environmental philosophy. Ecology is at the core of our integrated vegetation management program and frankly, we'd have it no other way. We believe that pollinator habitat represents the future of right-of-way management and that our practices set the stage for success. Simon Sinek, renowned and famed author and inspirational speaker, talks about having an infinite mindset in business 
In other words, focus, focusing on the long term instead of, instead of this year's budget or the practices for the next few years. And I believe that mindset can be, can be um, applied to this topic. Mechanical mowing maintenance of right-of-ways is one means of maintaining overhead power lines, but it's short-sighted and misses the opportunity to focus on a more comprehensive and less invasive practice. Maintenance practices consider a five-year window, but management considers the implications of practices over decades and the comprehensive impact of those efforts. We know that a well-developed integrated vegetation management program will give us a diverse ecosystem with quality wildlife habitat while reducing our overall right-of-way maintenance expenses. Repetitive mechanical mowing supports the invasive species that germinate quickly and then grow into problem trees that need to be taken care of. If new regulations are put in place regarding the monarch butterfly or other pollinators, electric utilities will respond, but with tactics that will cause them to comply. And, in comp and compliance does not equate to excellence. Only innovation and best practices can lead to that. My wife and I are raising our four kids in the cooperative service territory, and I'm committed to providing them, our neighbors, and our community with a planet that has reliable and affordable electricity and a habitat that is well cared for. So if I'm asking you not to regulate our business, I feel also obligated to come to you with solutions to the problem. So here they are. Through NRECA and our statewide organizations, cooperatives can positively impact habitat. At East Central Energy, we've already demonstrated that. The next step for us is to share the results of our efforts and to help others replicate the success that we're seeing. By executing an, on innovative and sustainable practices, we can lower our overall costs while preserving pollinator habitat. On the other hand, regulations will lead instead to least efforts and resistance to those restrictions. The upper Midwest is the host to the fourth generation monarchs, which are the ones that fly back to Mexico to overwinter and plays a critical role in habitat management along the central corridor. But we all have a vested interest in the success of the monarch. Best practices will need to span from my home state of Minnesota all the way to Mexico. As a beekeeper myself, I understand the importance of pollinators and I applaud this committee's thoughtfulness around the best path forward. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for the important work that this group does. You'll see my slides here if we can advance the next one. Uh, the first is the uh, pollinator habitat near one of our substations. This is our headquarters in Bram, Minnesota. We worked with the city to rezone that property and uh, cultivate it for habitat um, for pollinators. Next slide, please. And I believe there's one more slide which shows some uh, ditch right of way that's been maintained uh, with an ecological mindset and you see the pollinator habitat there. In closing, I hope that you'll join me in an infinite mindset around vegetation management, understanding that we have common goals and only need to stretch our thinking to develop best practices and mutually beneficial outcomes rather than more red tape for organizations to navigate. Let's come together to provide good habitat for our pollinators and for our future. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about our projects or this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johns. I wanna thank the panel for their testimony and uh, we'll now bring it back to members for their Questions, reminder to members that uh, under committee rule 3D, there's a five minute limit on questions and we will now uh, begin that process. I'll recognize myself for five minutes and I'd like to start with Mr. Rickard. Mr. Rickard, the more we talk about IUU fishing, the more I just feel like a dog on a bone. Uh, and it's not because I don't love NOAA and the mission and the professionalism of the people there who do such important work, but when it comes to this, scourge of IUU fishing, uh, they're not getting it done. And it is hard to avoid the conclusion that they just don't want to fix this problem. We get apologies, we get rationalizations for failure. We've got a program called SIMP that might as well be called WIMP. Uh, and so I don't blame uh, Dr. Spinrad or Ms. Coit. They have just landed in these new positions, but there's a problem somewhere in this agency. And they are going to really have to assert some leadership to make fundamental changes. And so uh, with that, let me begin by asking you about the fact that we're importing $2.4 billion worth of seafood uh, a year. No single industry was more negatively impacted by this problem than warm water shrimping, your industry. 
And uh, my bill uh, with Congressman Graves, who, by the way, would be with us, but he is simultaneously, and I, I understand three or four different hearings this morning. It's one of those days on Capitol Hill. Uh, but it's great to be working with him on this. And we're trying to increase traceability of seafood and hold companies strictly accountable for failing to ensure ethical practices from catch to plate. And I want to ask you to speak, please, to the impact that this bill would have on Gulf of Mexico uh, shrimping and American fishers more broadly. Thank you, Chair. The, I think you hit on a really important point for the industry, which is just how they see what NOAA Fisheries is doing. You know, for, for all commercial fishermen in the United States, the presence of imported seafood pushes down prices on what they get paid at the dock. That's just a reality of, of international trade. But as you, as you emphasize, this is $2.4 billion worth of seafood that shouldn't be in the marketplace at all. Um, and that's just a massive amount. And we can imagine a circumstance where NOAA just stopped enforcing our fishery management laws and allowed anyone to go out and catch shrimp in the U.S. waters however they saw fit. And if that happened, we'd see a lot more domestically harvested shrimp in the market. But for the shrimpers who continued to follow the law, they'd see prices paid at the dock for their catch plummet. And for American fishermen, that's the reality with imported seafood. The law prohibits the importation of seafood produced through IEU fishing, but NOAA doesn't enforce those laws. And as the commission's uh, report, the International Trade Commission's report found earlier this year, that has a massive impact on the bottom line for commercial fishermen. For across the industry, $60 million. For the domestic shrimp industry, $13 million in the pockets of small, medium-sized, family-run enterprises and coastal communities from Texas to North Carolina. And thanks for the question. And uh, let me ask you about the SIMP program, which only applies to 13 species groups. Why should NOAA expand that program to all species? You know, from, from the perspective of the shrimp industry, the thing that's most important is that shrimp remains part of SIMP. And I would just note that in the in, in what NOAA is saying now, what the agency is saying now, they're talking about gradual expansion. But in that report that they issued earlier this year, the end of the report notes that, you know, risk is not static. And it says, I quote, can, that the agency intends to, quote, conduct a risk-based analysis to determine whether the existing SIMP species remain at risk and whether additional species should now be included in SIMP due to increased risk, unquote. Look, the shrimp industry has strong views about the possibility of removing species from SIMP's coverage, and that seems to be what NOAA Fisheries is saying they are holding the ability to do at some point in the future. And that's, we're very concerned because it's not clear what the analysis is that's being done as to what risk is done because SIMP is not being enforced, because IU seafood is not being kept out of the market. Yeah. And when you, um, when you hear an agency offer these rationalizations for ineffectiveness, essentially saying it's just too hard. When you see them blowing off a specific congressional directive to take action, um, what you know? What do you, what do you have to say? Just closing thoughts about what seems to be a culture problem uh, at NOAA uh, in terms of doing the work that Congress has uh, directed them to do, and that we desperately need them to do. Your industry is directly harmed by this problem. How do you feel about the response we're getting? We've been getting for a long time now from NOAA. I think the main thing from the fisherman's perspective, and I'm not a fisherman, prepared for them, is, is they're heavily regulated. They see NOAA's enforcement efforts when the agency is engaged. And that's not what they're seeing with respect to seafood imports. And so their views are consistent with what you're saying. All right. Uh, Ranking Member Benz, are you with us? Yeah, yes, I am, Mr. Chair. All right, it's it's uh, your turn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I begin, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the hearing record letter from the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation concerning some of the bills we're hearing today. Without, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And also, uh, leading into my question of Mr. Johns, I just want to mention uh, there were some remarks earlier about uh, that, that reflect to me an incorrect understanding of my suggestion that we address uh, limitations under the current crafting of the ESA. And as I said in my opening statement, I think the way our uh, ESA is being implemented now forces agencies to choose between 
fish on the one hand and other uses. And this does not mean that uh, when I suggest uh, farmers and small communities and other people should get all of the water, it's just the opposite. But what I'm suggesting is we need to fix the ESA so we don't give all the water to just one use. So right now what they're forced to do and, and the, is, is give all of the water in this instance to the fish. And this is a consequence of an ESA that's inappropriately crafted. The CCAAs uh, are a device that are in, uh, that they've come up with that are utilized in anticipation of a listing. And that's why it's called a candidate uh, agreement. And so, uh, as opposed to a already uh, determined agreement. I just want to clear that what I'm asking for and, and asked for in the opening statement is a repair job on the ESA to make the thing work in a more balanced way so people aren't running from a draconian device that destroys communities, which is exactly the case in the Klamath right now, and in fact, across much of our wooded area in Oregon as we watch it burn up. Now with that, um, uh, Mr. Johns, how would listing the monarch butterfly impact your ability to innovate? Ranking member uh, Vince, thank you for the question. Um, you know, the CCAA was a collaboration between the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and many other agencies, including um, University of Illinois Chicago. And I think the work that's been done has just been fantastic. And our, our enrollment in that program has been beneficial to us. Uh, and I think the work that's being done is beneficial uh, to, to society as a whole and our industry, certainly. Um, the enrollment in CCAA is contingent on uh, the monarch not being listed. So as that progressed, it would certainly change the ability for others to participate and glean the knowledge and practices that we've been able to develop. So we're grateful for that opportunity. We'd like to see it continue. And, and, and Mr. Jones, do you think the ESA listing, should that occur, would that, in your opinion, benefit uh, the monarch species overall? Well, I would yield to the experts. I'm not a biologist, um, as you heard my education, but I will say um, that there are unintended consequences often with things that, like that that happen. Um, we're very grateful for the opportunity to participate in the CCAA, and we'd like to continue the work that's being done in that program. We just heard from Fish and Wildlife Service on our last panel. Is your opinion, in your opinion, what can they do to encourage more enrollment in, in the Monarch uh, Butterfly CCAA? Right. Uh, education awareness. I think uh, utilities, departments of transportation, I know in Minnesota we have a lot of, we're, we're benefit from a lot of state land and the ability to transform some of that into pollinator habitat could also be advantageous. I think an overall uh, strategic plan around CCAA to create monarch thoroughfares through our, through our country would be beneficial. Um, and I think we're on the right track with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's work on the CCAA. Uh, and I'd like to see that continue. And I want to go back to your earlier remarks because uh, the, the importance of the uh, scientific analysis, if you will, or the biological analysis of what you're doing cannot be overstated. Right. So uh, I think you said that to, to be uh, qualified as a CCAA, you have to be approved uh, by scientific analysis. And so that must be in the process of happening. And then are you also reaching out for further help uh, in, in the scientific uh, space so that you're getting it right? Well, we're certainly um, accountable for our CCAA en enrollment, and so we continue to work with the experts in the industry to ensure our continued enrollment in that program. Um, we are also uh, moving forward on a lot of environmental issues, uh, you know, removed from the monarch butterfly in particular. Uh, we think our corporate social responsibility extends far and wide, and we want to continue to meet our members' needs uh, for responsible environmental interfaces, if you will. And so um, we definitely work with experts as it's relevant. And finally, in the brief time we have left, uh, you, you are a not-for-profit utility. So what is this costing your members? Well, uh, fortunately, the, these best practices do result in savings. We spend between seven and nine million dollars a year on vegetation management. Of course, we have that cost regardless of our CCAA enrollment. Um, but, but the goal is, as I said, an infinite mindset. We invest now and we save in the future. And so um, we do have an increased cost. We haven't uh, really dialed that in yet, but we are uh, investing in our future because we intend to be here for a very long time serving the residents of rural Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I yield back. I thank the ranking member and uh, we'll now recognize the gentlelady from Michigan, Congresswoman Dingell for five minutes. Thank you again, Chairman Huffman and ranking member Benz uh, and all of the witnesses for lending us your time and expertise today. 
I appreciate the wide variety of conservation legislation before us, and it's really some very important uh, work. And the committee's willingness to include a number of bipartisan bills, including the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Um, I'd like to direct this to um, Mr. Romera. Thank you for your testimony and support of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. In your testimony, you mentioned the challenges that inconsistent and low funding levels have caused for species conservation efforts. How would the permanent dedicated funding in the Recovering America's Wildlife Act help meet the current backlog of wildlife conservation needs while ensuring successful conservation efforts moving forward? Yeah, thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you just for your, your absolutely incredible leadership on this entire effort. Um, I mean, like, like Dr. Zavaleta said, I mean, we have a lot of the tools. Um, we just haven't had them resourced. And, you know, in places where we have invested in, in saving species, whether that be the brown pelican example she used or the, the bald eagle, the brown pelican or the bald eagle, um, the American alligator, the you know, kind of the range of species that, that needed to be recovered, or species that we hunt and fish, like we've done a remarkable job bringing back duck populations from the brink um, over the past century because of things like Pittman-Robertson and, and the duck stamp. Um, where we've invested, we have done well. Where we haven't invested, we've seen kind of utter disaster. And so the predictability, and, and you know, and I know it's a it's a it's a big number, um, but frankly, it's a it's a fraction of the cost of inaction. Um, but we know that if we equip kind of great biologists and their conservation partners to be able to do the work on the ground. Um, we can save many of the 12,000 species that we're most concerned about right now. Um, thank you. You also discuss and highlight not only some of the innovative state-based efforts this legislation would fund, but also the outstanding work that the tribes have done on species conservation with limited resources. How does the 97.5 million in annual dedicated funding in Rawa allow tribes to build on their successful record of wildlife conservation? Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. And look, I think one of the, the longstanding historical injustices is that the vast majority of wildlife conservation programs in this country explicitly exclude the tribes from participating. There's a very small competitive grants program through the state wildlife grants program that all of you generously support, um, but it's very small, a few million dollars that's allocated you know, for a competitive program across the entire country. There's never been dedicated resources, despite the 140 million acres of, of tribal lands in this country, the incredibly important waters, the, the wildlife that I call them home. And so this is the most important piece of wild, frankly, conservation funding proposed ever for our, our tribal partners, which is why you've seen such broad support from tribal leaders from across the entire country. I mean, in every part of the country, you're, you're seeing tribal leaders you know, speak out, clamoring for the passage of this bill because it's so significant. Um, thanks to your leadership and, and, Chairman, and Chairman Huffman and Chairman Grijalva um, for building a tribal title into this legislation, which I think was one of the, the things that was lacking in the, the very first iteration of this bill a few years ago. Thank you. You also mentioned that the bill would create good local jobs in communities across the country and support healthier communities for people. What are some of the economic and job benefits of funding wildlife conservation? Yeah, I mean the the best things when I when I talk about when we save wildlife, we save ourselves. I mean, there's a there's a kind of a um, an overall feeling, all right, of, of success, but there's also a real big economic benefit. Every million dollars we invest in wildlife conservation creates between 17 and 30 jobs um, for that million dollars. These are jobs that are local. These are jobs that can't be outsourced. These are jobs where the money stays local. 80 to 90 percent of the money um, stays in the district or the state where the the project is. And so it's a, it's a way to really support a lot of job creation. I think it could align with the Civilian Conservation Corps and you know, a Civilian Climate Corps in a, in a really smart way, um, as well as help bolster outdoor recreation economies in some of the communities that are uh, slowest to recover from the, the pandemic. I mean, this is a true win-win-win on every level. So let me, in closing, just have you very quickly. Um, RAWA was modeled on two successful previous programs, Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson. Could you just talk about why they are successful and why this was modeled after it? You know, we, we've seen that the ability to have predictable revenue streams is absolutely critical to wildlife conservation. I mean, the successes for ducks and wild turkeys and, and deer and pronghorn and, and you know, bighorn sheep and a range of you know, trout and a range of sport fish um, is because of that predictability. And I think you know, that's why you're seeing you know, una unanimous support from all the, the major sportsman groups like the Congressional Sportsman Foundation, as well as you know, green groups like the Natural Resources Defense Council and LCV and 
you know, and so many others. And so I think that the predictability is one of the reasons for success. And the beautiful thing in this case is we have dedicated plans that you've all required. We just haven't funded them in the past uh, at the level necessary. So the plans are there. All we need is the money to, to save thousands of species across the country and replicate the successes that we've enjoyed in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I obviously yield back with some other time. Thank you very much. And I understand that my, my co-sponsor of the IUU fishing bill, uh, Garrett Graves of Louisiana, has extricated himself from the three other hearings he's been uh, juggling this morning. Uh, so, Mr. Graves, welcome. Uh, you're recognized. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Mr. Chairman, um, as you know, uh, you and I don't always see eye to eye on everything, but I, I do want to thank you very much for your leadership and partnering uh, on this very important legislation. Um, I appreciate you listening to us and, and some of the concerns that, that, that we had and some of the initial drafts and working with us. Um, I think this bill, the IUU bill, is, is absolutely critical. And it's everything from the environment to sustainable uh, global fisheries, uh, candidly, to national security with some of the things we've seen with other uh, countries using their fishing fleets. Um, and, and, and most importantly, uh, I think just leveling the playing field for, for our domestic fishers to have a fair shot. And, and as you know, and and we often talk about the United States often has some of the most stringent environmental and sustainable sustainability uh, regulations and best practices. And so the more we fish uh, and the more the, the United States and the globe depends upon our supply, it's actually better for, for the globe and for the environment. And, and we've got a, um, a great witness uh, today from the, from the Southern Shrimp Alliance. And um, I, I, I wanted to ask, um, uh, th first, thanks for participating uh, today, but um, and, and for your work with domestic seafood producers, can, can you talk a little bit about um, U.S. shrimp industry concerns with this influx of foreign shrimp that we've seen over the last uh, several years, and, and sort of the impact to the industry and to just the the, the global uh, fishery? Thank you so much for the. Congressman, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and for your uh, sponsorship of this bill. Um, you know, I just want to highlight three issues that are going on right now with the shrimp industry that I think that, that, that uh, your and Chair Hoffman's bill addresses. And the first is that shipment of foreign shrimp from producing countries to other countries for repacking prior to the United States. This is like how complex seafood supply chains have gotten. And we're seeing lots of Indian shrimp companies exporting to, say, Vietnamese shrimp exporters. These sh supply chains allow sh uh, shrimp to be laundered. It makes regulating IU fishing even more complicated, and it really goes to how important it is to enforce them. The second major issue for the shrimp industry right now that they're looking at is forced labor in shrimp supply chains. The continuation of production models that use contract labor in, for peeling shrimp um, after that same production model was found to have pervasive slave labor in Thailand is deeply concerning. And it causes not only losses in income to shrimp fishermen at the dock, but also to our shrimp processing industry. This is making less money because we're importing the majority of our peeled shrimp right now from India, where it's going through the same contract peeled laboring sheds that, it was, that were being used in Thailand. And the final thing is just the high percentage of IU fishing for imported warm water shrimp. The, in July, we, the Southern Shrimp Alliance asked for the HTS codes to be revised so that it breaks out wild caught shrimp from farm raised shrimp. And we're hoping that that will help NOAA to be able to focus on where there's a lot of shrimp coming into the market, as they estimated it being around 20, or the commission estimated it being around 20% of all shrimp being imported that that will provide tools to, per, to make sure that that doesn't enter our marketplace. So those are, those are kind of the things that we're focused on. You're muted, uh, Congressman Graves. Myself, um, sorry about that. Uh, one other question. Um, if, if you look at, at, at the text of, 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 our, of our bill, uh, the, uh, HR 3075, if, if that were implemented, how does it help to address the issues that you raised and sort of level that playing field? I think the, the main thing about the bill is is formalizing and enhancing the enforcement authority of NOAA fisheries. That the, the goal is to prevent the importation of seafood that should not be in this marketplace. And the bill is extensive. It has multiple ways of going at that particular uh, that problem, which is being wholly unaddressed right now. And so for the shrimp fishing industry, 
you know, what the, com the International Trade Commission's report finds is that is a pocketbook issue, that we're talking about $13 million more in the industry every year, more money for the, the fishermen that are working in Louisiana. And that's essential right now to guarantee the survival and continued investment in the industry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to say uh, one uh, hello and shout out to, to my friend, Mr. Romero. Good to see you. I um, appreciate you being here today. And and lastly, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to jump on my high horse for a minute and say as much as um, as, as you think I'm crazy, and um, I, may, I may reciprocate sometimes with you, um, this body has got to figure out those areas where people of very different views and very different constituents can find areas to work together like you and I have. And yep. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very imperfect, as you know, but I really do appreciate the uh, opportunity to find some of these niche areas where you and I can work together to do things that make sense and align for both of our districts. So I want to say thanks again. I thank the gentleman. We're, we're just getting warmed up on bipartisan uh, problem solving <laughs> here, Mr. Graves. So thank you for that. Uh, and with that, uh, we're going to go to Mr. Case uh, from Hawaii. Thank you again, uh, um, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, to all of our witnesses, uh, really grateful for your uh, testimony um, uh, to um, uh, Dr. Zavaleta and Mr. Omara in particular. I don't want you to feel like I'm, I'm, I'm omitting you. Um, I do appreciate um, your focus on... <clears throat> couple of goals that we're trying to pursue here. First of all, how do we dry up the market in the United States uh, for uh, endangered species uh, um, purchase and consumption and importation here? Because once we dry up that market, we really hurt uh, the actual uh, sources um, of the problem to start with. And second, how do we how do we adequately fund and resource and manage the protection of our, our endangered uh, um, species right here in, in uh, our country, uh, whether by land or air or sea. And I would be remiss if I did not um, uh, mention that, um, unfortunately, my Hawaii is both the endangered species capital of the world and the extinction capital of the world. Uh, and so much of what you uh, talked about uh, applies directly uh, to, to my state. Um, and um, But I want to go back to Mr. Ricard, because I'm, I would like the chair chewing on that same bone, um, IUU. Um, so, Mr. Ricard, straight question. How can we actually improve um, the specific bill that uh, Mr. Huffman has introduced and that I have um, uh, co-sponsored? And I give you three three areas where I at least have questions. Uh, number one, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a vessel um, um, a footage limitation, and I question whether there aren't a lot of IUU uh, fishing fleets out there at less than 50 feet. Uh, so that's one question for you. Uh, another is that um, should we should we um, actually uh, become more a lot more transparent in the vessel monitoring system that NOAA operates, which I think it uh, regards as proprietary. In all honesty, I don't think anybody fishing in our waters has a, an inherent right to privacy when they use the natural resources of our country. Uh, so that's an open question. And then finally, how do we get at um, high seas illegal fishing um, where there is an indirect nexus to our country, but nonetheless some nexus where we could actually um, uh, have some other consequence on clearly illegal fishing, even though the product of that fishing is not actually imported into our country. Thank you, Congressman Case, for the questions. I, um, this is where my, my technical knowledge isn't great about the, the vessels. I, I'd say that one of the th concerns that we have just as going forward is making sure that the agency is reporting what it's seen in its supply chain reporting and in its traceability reporting. So you've talked about uh, smaller vessels. Uh, you know, we also have a similar concern with respect to, to aggregation of farmed seafood out of ponds so that there is actually some traceability back that it just doesn't say, well, we got it from a whole bunch of different places and it came to one spot. That's, that's not traceability. And that has to be something that is addressed. So we think there is a parallel uh, circumstance when you're talking about, you know, vessels that, that might be smaller where, where that aggregation comes into play. Um, I think for the, the I just want to really focus on your last question, which is the high seas and legal stuff. One of the things that when the agency says that it, it, it is part of an interagency process or working with other agencies, one of the things that's left out is the specific explicit authority that the agency has to address issues of importance to this committee and frankly, to the entire country. And that is, to make, to leverage access to the U.S. market um, in order to ensure that, that countries do take uh, 
these issues seriously, whether it's IU fishing on its own or forced labor and seafood supply chains. By being able to, to take in the prohibitions um, on imports that are part of the statute already and be able to use that as a tool is just an, an incredibly important incentive to get uh, changes in, in the way that, that uh, this uh, proceeds overseas. Okay, so let me just make sure I understand you there. So you're 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 basically saying, okay, we can identify the illegal imports, uh, or well, we actually have a major problem in doing that right now. But assume we're doing it. Uh, you are saying essentially to broaden the range of penalties uh, that are associated with that. In other words, it's not just about um, you know, it's not just about you can't import anymore. Um, it is about another consequence at the Department of State level for perhaps the parent company, even the country itself. Is that right? Yes, under existing law, NOAA has the authority to prohibit imports of fish and fishing uh, products. Uh, that's already existing. It's just not something that's used. I know, but I'm asking, is there a broader range of penalties we should we should consider beyond just prohibiting the, the importation? I thought that's what you were saying by interagency cooperation. Right. I, I'm sorry. I'm just saying it, it doesn't go just to the specific product. It goes very far beyond that, which is okay. something way beyond what is currently even being contemplated. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I yield. Thank you, uh, Mr. Case. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Stauber for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Johns, East Central Energy entered into a first of its kind voluntary candidate conservation agreement with assurances for the Monarch in 2018. <clears throat> Can you describe for the committee how this agreement came about and the benefit to monarch habitat. Uh, the, the agreement came about um, really as a result, uh, as I said a little bit in my testimony, of our ecological practices and the things that we believed in kind of inherently. Um, and, and I think the second part of your question was the benefit to the monarch. Um, you know, I think as we establish habitat, uh, I was just kind of anecdotally golfing uh, on Tuesday with my brother and there were monarchs all over the place. So as I heard, Representative Panetta talk about the Western monarch. It's really a, that's a sad story, certainly, but I think the results of good habitat milkweed and the studies that are going on about the multitude of, uh, you know, species of milkweed and how that impacts the, the infrastructure or the um, ecological um, habitat really is important as well. And so um, I think the CCAA will lead to further studies of the success and why that worked, not just the methodology, but the results and what was important about the results that led to the success. So really looking forward to working with, uh, instead of against the, the U.S. Wild, Fish and Wildlife Service on this project and um, continued collaboration and, and cooperation. <clears throat> so East Central Energy, when you went, uh, went uh, got involved in the candidate conservation agreement, were you forced to do that or did you do that on your own as a- uh, No, that was completely voluntary. Okay. Uh, and how many organizations, uh, to your knowledge, have joined the Monarch CCAA in the last couple of years following the success of ECEs? So I think there's there's 27 who are enrolled right now, 27, 28, but there are another 60 or 70 that have pending agreement uh, enrollments, and so that's uh, significant. There's 900 electric cooperatives in the country, so uh, except for Hawaii, I believe we could benefit with Monarchs for all of those. Um, and so, you know, I think that's just a, a good uh, goal to set is to, you know, raise awareness and help folks understand that there are there is alignment between these environmental and fiscal goals that we have as a, as a nonprofit to serve our members a uh, valuable product. And again, on those cooperatives, as you get more people uh, make, you know, becoming part of this uh, agreement, are they forced to do it or they do it on their own? No, it's, it's voluntary at this point. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Johns, just this morning, I sent a letter to Secretary Halland with 16 other Republicans urging her not to list the monarch under the Endangered Species Act, countering a push by this committee's majority. Can you describe how listing the monarch as proposed by my Democrat colleagues would upend the work done by East Central and other organizations? Well, I believe um, our CCAA would be protected in the case of a listing. However, the forward progress that we were just talking about would be, would be stifled. Uh, other cooperatives would have less of an opportunity to gain from that knowledge and understanding. Uh, and I could imagine uh, they might be even more um, kind of regressive in their thought process in order to um, comply with uh, regulations associated with a listing. When you have um, a government agency dictating or mandating 
um, when you are mandated to do something by the federal government, and um, in this case, East Central Energy absorbs a cost, do you pass it on to your customers? Correct. Our, <laughs> our customers are members um, and member owners, in fact. And so they own a portion of the equity in the organization, much as a shareholder would uh, of, of an investor-owned utility. And so uh, any costs that come to us are passed through to them uh, in either debt or in higher bills. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> I'd like to enter uh, the letter I sent with 16 of my Republican colleagues into the record, and I yield back. Uh, without objection, that will be entered into the record. And we will now come back to the West Coast and recognize uh, Congressman Alan Lowenthal for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, this is for a, doctor, a question. I have two questions for Dr. Zavaleta. Uh, my first is, doctor, can you speak to the ecosystem implication of illegal fishing? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Lowenthal. I think to begin with, you know, illegal fishing impacts a huge range of issues that have already been raised by Mr. Ricard and others today, um, slavery, human rights, and health. In terms of ecological damage and damage to fisheries, I'm not an expert there, but I would say that um, there's no question that if we are not attending to illegal fishing, um, you know, in a number of ways, it's it's sort of lowering the bar for what other fishers are going to do to be able to compete in the marketplace. And so, you know, we're sort of setting ourselves up to have uh, fishing that is more harmful to marine wildlife, more harmful to water quality and to the coastal oceans, as well as harmful to human and labor rights. I want to talk about finfish aquaculture sustainability. And I know you, all your work on your research on ecosystems, inherent complexity and the interconnectivity between ecosystem changes and climate changes and human well-being. I'd like for you to speak to the factors affecting finfish aquaculture sustainability from both an ecological and a community perspective. Yes, thanks. Um, so finfish aquaculture in the open ocean carries inherent risks, um, some of which have already been mentioned. The big one is escapement of domesticated and genetically engineered fishes. They can prey on, outcompete, or introduce harmful genes into wild fishes. And then we also face risks from pollution, from excess feed and from fish waste, disease and parasites that can spread to wild fishes, and then higher concentrations of contaminants that are harmful to human health in the fish themselves. So those impacts could damage wild fisheries and marine economies, as well as ecosystems. I think regulation is crucial to managing those risks and not just in the US. And as I said, I worry most about invasion risks because my understanding is that a certain amount of escapement is inevitable. Um, storms, shark attacks, wear and tear on fish pens, industrial accidents all mean that some fish will escape. So I agree in particular with other scientists that non-native and especially transgenic fishes don't have a place in open ocean aquaculture. And stepping back, there's sound evidence that improvements in wild fisheries management could increase global sustainable fin fish yields roughly as much as the current contributions of marine fish, fin fish aquaculture to global consumption. So well-managed wild fisheries are the gold standard. Those are the way to protect the ocean and sustain fin fishing economies and to provide protein. Thank you. And I'm going to yield back, Mr. Chair. Well, thanks very much, Congressman Lowenthal, and I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony. Uh, members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we'll ask you to respond to those in writing. Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit written questions within three business days following the hearing, and the record will be held open for 10 business days to allow for the witnesses to respond. If there's no further business before the subcommittee, then without objection, we stand adjourned.